first thing that we talked about was, see if anybody remembers. Wisdom. Wisdom. All right. The second thing, believe that you can resist. The third thing, be prepared ahead of time. The next thing, avoid the very scenes of temptation. Now, I don't even know how to tell you how important it is who you hang out with, who you become intimately involved with, who you listen to, what you watch, what you hear, the kind of books and magazines that you look at. Now, you know, this is not rocket science. If you're a man and you're having trouble with pornography, and the magazine that your wife gets for ladies' underwear shows up, you don't need to sneak it in your lunch pail. <laughs> now, you know, I don't know how to do this other than to just be honest, you know? I mean, I'm a woman and I throw a lot of that stuff away when it comes to my house because I didn't order a magazine to have half-naked women laying on my counter. That's not what I want. Well, it's just a magazine. Well, do you want your sons, your daughters looking at that? We have to start fighting for ourselves. And I'm not talking about being a religious prude where you feel like you can never, you know, see, you know. We don't need to be like the Pharisees who put things over their eyes lest they see a woman and get into sin. You know? <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. But I am saying that we need to be careful who we spend time with. I'm going to read you a little something. A young girl was walking down a mountain path, beginning to make her way up the mountain, and it was very cold outside. And while on her journey, a snake approached her. And the snake said, please pick me up and put me in your coat. I'm very cold. Mm. You should have seen this morning when I told one of my guys, go get me a rubber snake. He said, that takes the cake. But they came back with three. I got to choose my color. Pick me up. I'm so cold. The girl said, oh, no, you know I can't do that. Oh, please, he said, make me warm. Okay. Okay, she said, you can hide inside my coat. The snake called itself up, became very warm and quiet. The girl thought everything was okay when suddenly, ah! You bit me! Why did you do that? I trusted you! And the snake said, well, you knew what I was when you picked me up. Come on, can I get a witness today? If you spent 30 years as an alcoholic and you have, the last 10 years, you've enjoyed freedom with God. And the guys that work on Friday night want you to go sit in a bar with them where the waitresses are not dressed properly. And, you know, you think, well, I'll just have a club soda. Well, you know what? I'm not telling you to stay away from, from all unbelievers. I'm going to read you a scripture in a minute that tells you you can't avoid all unbelievers. And I, that's, we have to be careful as Christians about making everybody think that we think we're too good to be around them. But I say this all the time. You better make sure that you're affecting them and they're not infecting you. And there's a big, 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 big difference. You know the danger if you've been hooked on drugs of going and hanging out with your old friends. Well, I, yeah, I, I'll be cool. It, it'll be cool. I'm good now. 
Yeah. Praise the Lord. Strong in the Lord. Hallelujah. Greater. Ah! You bit me. Well, you knew what you were doing when you went. Amen? Somebody should probably have my rubber snake to take home with you to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Psalm 1 1. I don't like snakes, not even rubber ones. <laughs> Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable is the man who walks and lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, following their advice, their plans, and purposes, nor stands submissive and inactive in the path where sinners walk, nor sits down to rest and relax where the scornful and the mockers gather. Now, let me just tell you something, sweet little Christian. <laughs> if you go sit at the lunch table at work day after day after day, with the gossipers, the complainers, the ungrateful, the unthankful. You just sit there long enough, and you know what, pretty soon, that's going to get off on you. And the job that you once were thankful for, and so glad to have, and so grateful to have, you're going to begin, well, they just don't pay me enough, and I don't like this, and I don't like that, and you know, I'm tired of having a desk with no window, and I think it's too cold in here, and it's too hot, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, on and on and on. The best thing for you to do is be reasonably friendly with those people. You don't want them to make them think that, you know, you think that you're better than them. You might even be able to eat lunch with them once every three months and just sit there and try to come back with something positive when they say something negative, but you don't need to just be sitting inactive in the pathway where sinners walk, just sitting there, sitting there, and just soaking it in, and soaking it in, and soaking it in. I believe that one of the most important things in our life is who we become intimate with, who we become close to. Not just casual acquaintances, but who we really spend a lot of time with. The people that are around us affect us probably more than anything else. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. You need to be around people that are going to challenge you just by their behavior to come up higher in your walk with God. They don't even have to preach a sermon to you. It's just the way that they are. When Dave had his birthday party, we invited several of the guys that he plays golf with. And uh, one of them said to me, he said, you know, Dave is amazing. No matter how he plays golf, he just stays peaceful never gets mad. Well, you know what? That wasn't the case for a lot of years. I mean, when I first married Dave, he was throwing golf clubs in trees and, you know, it, it was not a pretty sight. And I mean, I'd go out with him trying to be a, you know, good little wife off. This is what you're interested in. I'll try to be interested. And I mean, it could rain and he wouldn't take me home. It could be in freezing temperatures and he wouldn't take me home. He was going to finish his golf game. And he's changed, you know, God changes us as we spend time with him. Well now, just the way he is on the golf course is a witness to the other people that they don't have to get mad and they don't have to act like that because they see him. Everywhere we go, we need to be a witness. We don't have to preach to everybody. We can be a sermon to everybody that we come near. Amen? Proverbs 5, 8. Let your way in life be far from her, and her in this instance is the loose woman, and come not near the door of her house. Avoid the very scenes of temptation. Man. If you would just read what the Bible says about adultery and where it leads, and really take it for what it is, you'd run from it just like you would this poisonous snake. And it always gets quiet when I talk about this, but I don't care because it needs to be talked about in church. Yeah. Amen? I've had the same man 43 and a half years. I would not start over with another one. Yeah. 
Look, keep the one you got. The grass is not greener on the other side. You're going to have to mow it too. Amen. Woo. Avoid the very scenes of temptation. I mean, the Bible says in Proverbs that when a man gets involved in an adulterous affair, and the same thing goes for women, that they are destroying their lives. Now, I'm not saying that you can't recover from something like that. I know full well talking about this and going on television, there are probably millions of people that have already made that mistake and maybe in the process of making it again. Well, stop it. <laughs> you want a word from God? Flee from temptation. <laughs> Run from temptation. And don't play around with it. You know why people fall into temptation? They flirt with it. Now, I won't do anything. I'll just think about it. You're not going to conquer sin if you don't conquer your thoughts. Amen? We had a guy one time that started bringing one girl in the office donuts every morning. Took about one week and a half, and I just got right in the middle of him. I said... You either bring donuts to everybody or you don't bring donuts. <laughs> he, was, he was in charge of my radio program. Then I said, you're the radio man, not the donut man. <laughs> you got to put a stop to stuff like that. You say, well what, was, well, what was wrong with him bringing her donuts? Something was wrong with it because I sensed it in my spirit. Why was he bringing them to her and her only every day? And he probably thought it was just a donut, but I'm telling you, it could have turned into a huge problem. You need to realize what you're picking up if you pick up a snake, and don't expect to not get bit, because you will. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. I'm so glad I have this pulpit to lean on. I wrote you in my previous letter, Paul said, not to associate closely and habitually with impure people. Now, it's not saying you can't be around anybody that's not a Christian. That's been a large part of our problem. Unbelievers think that we think we're too good to have anything to do with them. I have had the privilege of leading many people into the kingdom by just simply being friendly with them, and sometimes for a long period of time, even giving them gifts and doing things for them, but still did not get closely and habitually, intimately involved with them. Amen? Let's put it back up. Not meaning, of course, that you must altogether shun the immoral people of this world, or the greedy graspers and cheats and thieves or idolaters, since otherwise you would need to get out of the world and human society altogether. But now I write to you not to associate, now this is a little hard to swallow sometimes, but it's in the book. Don't associate with anyone who bears the name of Christian brother <laughs> if he's known to be guilty of immorality or greed or is an idolater whose soul is devoted to any object that usurps the place of God or a person with a foul tongue, railing, abusing, reviling, slandering, or is a drunkard or a swindler or a robber. No, you must not so much as even eat a meal with a person like that. Some of you are thinking, man, I wish you wouldn't have brought that up. I may have to go to lunch alone now. <laughs> I'll tell you what we need to do a lot more. We need to speak the truth in love. And if you're with a Christian brother or sister, and their behavior is really bad, then if you really love them in love, you need to tell them, you know, you're only hurting yourself behaving like that. God is good to us. He's done a lot for us. I don't want to sit here and have a complaining session. And if that's what you're going to do, then I'm just really not going to be able to hang out with you. <clears throat> I wonder how many people keep the snake because they don't want to hurt his feelings. <laughs> well, I don't want to hurt your feelings. After all, we've all got problems. Yeah, we do. And we need to be patient. The Bible says that love makes allowances. I'm not talking about an oops. I'm talking about somebody who's got a behavior pattern.
How many of you know somebody that just complains all the time? All the time, all the time. Well, you know what? Then you need to tell them that that's not what you want to hear. And if that's what they're going to do, then they're going to be seeing less of you. Okay, I'll go on. I can tell that's messing with your brains. <laughs> Obviously, you need to be led by the Holy Spirit in these things, but you can't just sit passive and inactive in the pathway of sinners and think that it's not going to affect you. Yes, you can be an example, but once again, if your example is not affecting them and they're infecting you, then it's time to make another decision. And I don't know about the don't eat a meal with them thing, you know, I don't know if that was just representative of Paul saying you need to be really careful how much time you spend with people like that. But I'm just, I'm not making a law, I'm not trying to tell you what to do in your own specific situation, but I'm just simply telling you that you just sit passive and inactive and not ever confront that kind of behavior or ever try to get somebody to change or turn around and just let them be the way they are and think it's not going to affect you is a bad decision. Now, I know I just messed with your social life, but, and it goes on and on. It says, avoid the very path of evil and stay away from evil men. How many of you know how wonderful it feels to spend the day with somebody that's really wholesome and, and they have some depth to them, you know? I love to spend time with somebody that's got some spiritual depth that I feel like I can really talk to them about spiritual things, not just avoiding the next idle gossip every time I turn around. And then I think the fifth thing that we really need to realize if we want to overcome temptation is that we can't trust ourselves too much. And I think this is really important. I'd say out of these five things that I've mentioned today, all five are really important, but I would say the two that I would want you to concentrate on the most, especially if you have a hard time remembering five, remember these two. Be very careful who you spend your time with and don't trust yourself too much. I think one of the main reasons why people have problems is they lean on themselves instead of on God. I mean, even in situations where, you know, when I first started hearing the Word and I was really being confronted by the Word of God and knowing that my behavior was wrong, as I said before, I went to church for a lot of years and just attended church and went home, nothing ever changed in my life. But when I became a serious student of the Word of God, not just reading it, but wanting to apply it to my life, it became very obvious to me very quick that I needed to change. But I didn't know some of the things that I'm telling you today. It took me a lot of years to figure it out. And so I spent a lot of years trying to change myself. I tried. I had plans. I had programs. I, I, me, me, I, I. See, I always wants to do it so I can get the credit for any success. I mean, I really suffered for a long time. I mean, the Bible tells us over and over that it's the humble that get the help, the proud and the haughty. He ignores until they humble themselves and ask for help. And I finally found in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, where Paul said to the people, do you really think that after having received the Holy Spirit through the grace and the mercy of God, that you're now going to reach perfection by dependence on the flesh? See, you can't even change yourself. Whatever you hear here this weekend that you think, man, that's right, I'm convicted. Yep, I'm going to go home and change that. No, you won't. You're going about it the wrong way. You need to say, God, I'm going to write this down. I'm going to go home and start praying about this. I'm going to start studying in this area. And God, I, I, I need you to help me because I can't do it without you. I can't do it without you. Deuteronomy chapter 8 is a very precious chapter in the Bible to me. I mean, it means more to me than what I even know how to tell you because I've lived it. And he starts out with the Israelites and he says, I've led you all this way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble you, to prove you, to test you, to see if you would keep my commandments or not. Part of our journey in the wilderness and through these different trials and things that we don't like is just a testing from God. God permits them for a while to test us to see if we'll do what's right even when we're not getting what we feel is the right result from the efforts that we're putting into being 
a Christian. Amen? You will get right results, but the Bible says, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due time you shall reap if you faint not. Well, that whole due time thing is a little aggravating because nobody knows exactly when that is. It seems to be this mystical time that only God knows anything about. And so what he expects us to do in the meantime is to believe, even when we don't see or we don't feel, or it doesn't even seem to be working for us, we believe because God's put it in our heart. And we want, we want to change. We want to see things change in our life. But we can't change ourselves. And so the Israelites, like us, we all go through a time in the wilderness. Every single one of us, we go through a time in the wilderness. After salvation, you hear about the promises of God, you head for the promised land, but we all go through a time in the wilderness where God's dealing with us. It's just that simple. He's dealing with us. And He permits that to humble us, to humble us, to humble us. I love what the Apostle Paul said in, I see the first, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, we had trials that we could not even believe. And he goes on about how hard they were and how distressing they were. And he said, but God permitted this to keep us from trusting in ourselves. Let me tell you something. It's good for you to have something that's more than you can handle. The thing that we don't realize is everything is more than we can handle. We just don't get it. Me coming here today and this meeting, me leaving and this meeting being successful, it's impossible for me to do. Well, Joyce, that shouldn't be hard. You've done it thousands and thousands of times. Yes, I have, but that would be the most dangerous thing in the world that I could think. No problem. Hey, I've done that before. Don't need to prepare. Don't need to pray. Don't need to study. Just go over. Blah, 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 blah. I read a book recently that I thought was just a phenomenal book. And uh, it was about a man who was a minister. He's gone home to be with the Lord now, and his testimony is public, so I feel like it's okay for me to talk about it, although I'm not going to mention his name. He, back in the 70s, he had a tremendously fast-growing mega church. And it just seemed like that he could do no wrong. I mean, everything that he touched worked. It was good. And he had started out right with God, humble, giving himself to humble tasks, doing anything God asked him to do, keeping right motives, spending time with God, praying, treating people right, being a blessing everywhere that he went, being involved in missions, on and on and on. Well, he ended up getting in some very serious trouble because he started assuming that he could just do projects. There were good projects, there were good works, but he wasn't really taking the time to find out, is this really you, God? Is this your timing? Is me doing this project meeting all the other guidelines? Like his wife was not for it, but he pressed ahead and did it anyway. Long story short, he ended up getting all kinds of financial problems because of that and couldn't pay his bills and on and on and on and on and on and ended up being a judge guilty of some fraud. And the, the sad thing was, was he didn't even really understand what was wrong until it was too late and he finally had time to stop and think about it. And I love sometimes to learn not only from my mistakes, but from people who have made great mistakes. There was a statement in this book that I just thought was phenomenal. The time that we are the most vulnerable in our life is not when we're weak, it's when we're strong.